The Louis T. Network is powered by Music Head University. Music Heads, classes in session. Turn me up. Enroll on YouTube now. Link is in the description. Who else could it be? For me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the Command Post Live. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. So, the process is starting to really heat up, and we're getting into that crunch time period when you are talking about quarterbacks and, and making a decision at the top of the draft as the commanders, Patriots, and the Bears are going to have to do. I feel like the haze in the barn with the Bears already, but um, there are some big decisions to be made. And um, Washington now is three fourths of the way through um, the quarterbacks that they'll be probing in terms of the pro days. Uh, one left tomorrow, North Carolina will have their pro day featuring Drake May, and that will complete the cipher for the teams at the top of the draft. Um, McCarthy already had his, Williams already had his. Today was LSU's pro day, which featured Jaden Daniels, the Heisman Trophy winner. We'll talk about the pro day, what it looked like, how I how I'm kind of feeling about all of this. And I've got a couple of, I don't want to call them hot takes, but um I'm this is what I think they're thinking. And of course, I don't know. And and this is the beauty of what. Peters and Quinn and company have done so um, effortlessly thus far. It's all new to us, and I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Is we don't know what the hell they're going to do. There are times where I'm like, they know. And then there are times where I'm like, they have no idea, do they? I, I in my heart of hearts, think that they're leaning in in a direction. And when I say they, I think right now, this is my guess, that the front office feels one way and the coaching staff feels another way. We'll expound upon that a little bit later on in the show. Uh, but I want to start the show off by giving you my thoughts on the pro day overall. So shout out to everybody that sent me the pro day. I got uh, at least three people that sent it to me today. And I was able to kind of look at it and watch it and kind of digest it. And look, pro days are a lot like the combine. You don't overreact to anything that you see. You, you take it in, you store it as information and data. But what the combine really is for is for meeting these prospects for the first time, getting the medicals, right? Getting information that is vital to the process and meeting someone for the first time. You've heard the old adage, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. That's true, right? And so meeting these guys for the first time, kind of seeing the vibes, it's only 15 minutes, so there's only so much you can do, but you do get a, a sense of, okay, you know, kind of like the energy that this guy emitted, like some of the things that he said, uh, can't wait to, to meet with him again and talk to him some more and kind of really get to know him. And so I think that pro days are overrated, especially for quarterbacks. I think pro days are, are great for skill guys. If you don't like, like what Malik Neighbors did today is what he did, uh, uh, I think, is effectively nailed down his position as wide receiver one or two. Uh, there's been this foregone conclusion that Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be the first receiver pick. And more likely than not, he will. I, I kind of feel like it's almost like Caleb Williams at the quarterback position. There's not, there's anything, there's nothing that he can really do wrong at this point, but he's done nothing during this process. You know, he's standing on business and that's cool. But Malik neighbors went out and ran like a four, three, five today. 
I don't know what Marvin Harrison Jr. would run, you know, and we all know he's fast, but how fast? We don't know, and he's not willing to show, and that's fine. You know, nobody's gonna nobody's gonna, you know, crush him for not running. But Malik Neighbors ran today and solidified that the tape is there. Now you can put a speed to it. Because one of my questions with Malik Neighbors is, bro, just how fast are you anyway? But for a quarterback, you're scripting your throws, you're setting everything up. The idea it's an ideal setup for you, the environment is ideal. And it's everything that you want it to be, which is why you don't throw at the combine, because it's not the, the perfect setting. You're not throwing to your receivers. You're not in your own gym. You're not getting a good night's rest, sleeping in your own bed the night before. You know, it's not you controlling the environment and the circumstances and the situation. A pro day is. It's scripted. You're going to get X amount of throws. X amount of throws to the left, X amount of throws to the right, X amount of throws rolling out, X amount of deep balls. Um, you, you know what's coming because you set it up. And it's supposed to highlight some of the throws that you'll be asked to do and simulate the throws that you'll be making during the course of an NFL game. You don't want to be disastrous throwing against the air. Okay. We've seen some pretty bad pro days. I don't think there was any pro day worse than Teddy Bridgewater's once upon a time. He went on to have a very long NFL career. And if he wanted to, he could still be playing right now. He chose to do, to retire and coach high school football. If he wanted a backup quarterback job right now, Teddy Bridgewater would have it. So, so much for having one of the worst pro days we've ever seen. You know who Michael Mayock said had the best pro day he's ever seen? It was in that same building, right there where they were today, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He was there for a guy by the name of Jamarcus Russell. And Mike Mayock said it was the greatest pro day he had ever seen. How'd his NFL career turn out? So again, don't get too high on these pro days. Don't get too low on these pro days. Take it for what it's worth. Add it into the mental Rolodex of information that you've stored on that player, and you move on. And again, this these pro days are really for the evaluators. I told you, watching a pro day on television is akin to watching the combine or watching tape, watching film except there's no other players on the field other than the guy, the quarterback and the guy he's throwing the football to. But again, it doesn't do anything for us at home. It's really for those in attendance. And pro days are more about the conversations you have with the coaching staff, people off the record. Hey man, tell me a little bit about Jaden Daniels, you know, and give me your best Jaden Daniels story. You know, talk about a time where, you saw Jaden and he didn't seem like himself. You, The answer needs to be, I've never seen him like that. You know, this guy's the same guy every single day. You know you can depend on him. That's the answer you're looking for. But you're asking those questions to see what someone has to say about him. Generally, you expect people who are affiliated with the university to say nice things about him. Now, if you know these people, and you're like, no, give it to me straight. Like, you know, give me the reels. They'll tell you all the things you want to hear. You know, all the things you need to know, rather. I don't think I've ever seen a coach sell a player more than Jim Harbaugh is currently selling J.J. McCarthy. I've never seen this shit before in my life. He's like a used car salesman with J.J. McCarthy. I mean... He's talking about J.J. McCarthy as if he he invented the wheel. So much so that people are like, bro, if you if you think he's this good, then trade Justin Herbert and you take him at five. Of course, he's not going to do that. <laughs> but 
my overall thoughts on the pro day is that it was up and down. It was uneven. Okay. It was mixed. I didn't walk away from it wowed and blown away, but who cares? I don't. I, I the way I feel about Jaden Daniels did not change one bit because of the throws that he missed or the throws over the middle that may have been high or the ones on the outside on the outbreaking routes that were a little high and out of bounds or this, that, and the third. None of that bothers me. Not moved at all. Was it the cleanest pro day? No, it wasn't. Generally, when you have one of these, let's say you script 65 throws, you'd like to complete 60 of those if at all possible, right? In an ideal world, if you're throwing it 50 times, you'd like to complete 45 of them. You know, the ball's going to hit the ground, you know, four or five times at, at least, especially if you're outdoors where you can't control the elements. You know, some of these pro days aren't held in fancy bubbles like the one Jaden Daniels had his pro day in where you can control the environment and you don't have to deal with the elements. Some of these are actually held outside like Caleb Williams's was. And sometimes it rains during that day. You got to deal with it, right? Not when you're doing it inside. But at the end of the day, he missed throws that you'd like to see him hit. He made some throws down the field, the deep ball. It looked pretty good. He hit a bunch of them. He missed a couple, but he hit more than he missed. At the end of the day, nothing's changed for me. I don't think they walked away, you know, disappointed or felt any differently about him than they went into the process feeling about him. I think it's more about the conversations that they had with people about him. And I think it was more about the conversations they had with Jaden. And they're going to continue to have conversations with Jaden. And, and they've told us they're going to have Zoom conference calls with him and the other quarterbacks that they're considering it too. And <clears throat> they may have, you know, in-person visits where they use one of their official 30 visits on these quarterbacks. Uh, I would recommend that they do so. You have to do your due diligence. And, and if you really want to get to the bottom of this thing, you have to meet with these guys as many times as humanly possible to really get down to the, the bare bones of this thing and figure out exactly what the best decision uh, for the commanders at number two overall at quarterback is. And I expect them to do that. Leave no stone unturned. That said, I'm going to tell you what I think right now. What I've gathered from listening to those in the know and those around um, the situation and what they've been saying and then kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together of what's been said by Adam Peters and Dan Quinn um, and, and some of their body language and some of the things that um, we've heard people kind of report. Again, we know nothing. And I'm not going to sit here and act as if I know something because I don't. And for that matter, nobody does. Nobody does. Somebody sent me a clip. I believe it was yesterday. And I want to say it was Miss Perry. Shout out to Miss P. And the rest of the mob, y'all know what it is. But I think it was yesterday. He was on a show. I want to say it was Pat McAfee. I, I don't know what show it was. It, it, it's irrelevant, whatever show he was on. He was on the show. Adam Schefter was. And he's the only one that's gotten anything right, you know, since the, the turnover of this new regime and, and um, Adam Peters uh, coming into the building. He was the only one that had... Ben Johnson not being the guy. Everybody else was kind of, it, it literally was an echo chamber and he was the only one yelling back at the echo chamber, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Schefter said that he thinks that the commanders are leaning Jaden Daniels. We've heard that before. Now he said it's, I guess 
he wouldn't even go as far as to call it an educated guess because he said, I don't have enough information to even feel like it's an educated guess. It's just a hunch. That's all we can all go off of right now is a hunch because nobody knows anything, which is a good thing. Even us as fans who are starving for information who want to know, it's good that we don't know, right? And we won't know until April 25th at roughly 817, let's call it, okay? Whatever the case may be, probably more like 822, but who's keeping score, right? Who's keeping count of that? Here's how I see it right now, okay? I think... As of right now, and there's still a lot of process to go, as Adam Peters said um, on Monday at uh, the owners' meetings, the league meetings, rather, in Orlando when he had the little media scrum. There's a month left, and that's a lot of time. It may seem like it's not a lot of time. But any of us who have gone through this process as fans waiting for the draft, we know a month is an eternity. And the, the, these gears that are turning, they're just getting started. This shit is going to take so many turns. We started out this process. Drake May was probably the favorite to be the number two overall pick. Then it went to Jaden Daniels. Now it's J.J. McCarthy who is gaining steam, right, on that number two overall pick. So, and it's going to continue to change. It's going to fluctuate. You're going to hear this. You're going to hear that. When you when people don't know, they assume, they make things up, which is what I'm about to do, <laughs> right? I'm no different. So here's what my brain has conjured up, putting all of the pieces of the puzzle together that we've been given. Nothing has been definitive. I can't substantiate anything, but here's... What I've gathered. If you ask me, the staff, and when I say the staff, I'm talking head coach Dan Quinn and offensive coordinator Cliff Kingsbury. I think the staff are leaning towards Jaden Daniels, JD5. Okay. Why do I say that? When you think about a defensive coordinator, and Dan Quinn has answered this question multiple times. When, you, when defensive coordinators think about guys they want on their side, they think about what's the player or coach I wouldn't want to have to coach against. The, the guy that gave me the most trouble. Remember what Dan Quinn said about Cliff Kingsbury and why he wanted him to be on his staff? And he said, one day I want to have that guy on my staff because he said, this guy gave me fits. When we were in college, I really liked his style. And he said, when we got to the NFL, I saw him again. And I said, this guy knows what he's doing. He's a tough son of a bitch to have to game plan against. You know what Dan Quinn said is the hardest quarterback to defend? You guessed it. The mobile quarterback. The guy that when things break down, he's able to make things happen with his legs. He's told us already that Jaden Daniels is a playmaker and he is a, a guy that you have to the game plan to stop. He's told us this already. So we know he's fond of him. Cliff Kingsbury, every coach or every quarterback rather that he's had Of, of note that has made it to the NFL, including Case Keenum, who he had back in the day as an offensive coordinator or a quarterback's coach, I believe, at Houston, to Johnny Manziel in his Heisman Trophy year and in those years at Texas A&M, to Baker Mayfield, to Patrick Mahomes, to... Kyler Murray, to then finally Caleb Williams, all have 
a single trait in common. They're mobile. Some more than others, but the ability to run is something that must be present. And if we get specifically to his NFL success, it came with Kyler Murray and it came with a quarterback whose legs were a huge part of the run game and the pass game. I think those two right now are leaning towards Jaden Daniels. And maybe there's this outside shot that Cliff Kingsbury having ha- having his principles and the 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 basis of what he does, the foundation being the air raid and Drake May having played in the air raid. Maybe there's a little bit of that that's at play, potentially. But I think those two guys right now would be cool with taking Jaden Daniels. You know what I think the front office, and I'm talking about two guys in particular. When I say the front office, so when I say the coaching staff, I'm talking about two guys, Cliff Kingsbury and Dan Quinn. When I say the front office, I'm talking about two guys. I'm talking about Adam Peters. And I'm talking about Lance Newmark. So I'm talking about GM and assistant GM. You know who I think they're leaning towards right now? And again, still got a long way to go in this process. I think those two are leaning towards J.J. McCarthy. Here's why I say this. If you look at Lance Newmark, he's coming from Detroit. Who's the quarterback in Detroit right now? Who helped turn the Lions organization around? Former number one overall pick, Jared Goff. What are the strengths of Jared Goff's game? He's not very mobile, which J.J. McCarthy is a lot more mobile than Jared Goff is. But he's accurate with the football as Jared Goff. He's a quick decision maker. And he doesn't turn the football over very much okay now there have been times in his career where he hasn't lived up to that billing but since he's gotten to Detroit he's done a damn good job of taking care of the football as Jared Goff and if not for some shoddy defense and receivers who act like they couldn't catch in the NFC championship game he would have taken his second not his first his second NFL franchise to the Super Bowl. In J.J. McCarthy, Lance Newmark probably sees a lot of redeeming qualities that remind him of the guy that helped come in and turn things around in Detroit. There's something to be said about your past experiences and the successes that you've had and also the failures that you've had. They help shape and mold the way you conduct business. We're humans. This is how these things work. So Lance Newmark is coming from Detroit where he's seen a quarterback like J.J. McCarthy work. He knows what a guy that can take care of the football, that will take completions, that will stay ahead of the sticks, keep the offense on schedule. He's seen what that can look like and what that can lead to. You look at Adam Peters. He's coming from San Francisco. But you got to go all the way back, way back into time to understand the inner workings of Adam Peters' mind. You got to go all the way back to his first job as a scout in New England when Tom Brady was the man, right? When he took over for Drew Bledsoe and what kind of a quarterback Tom Brady was in his career. Tom Brady wasn't mobile. Tom Brady did his work and was surgical from the pocket. Tom Brady was extremely accurate. Tom Brady took the check downs, he took what the defense was giving him, he managed the game, and he became one of the greatest game managers we've ever seen in our lives. 
one of the most clutch football players we've ever seen in our lives. He then goes on to Denver, where he encounters Peyton Manning at the tail end of his career. They win the Super Bowl, but Manning wasn't the reason they won the Super Bowl. They were tasked, him and that staff, as the scouts that were there, and he was moving his way up the ladder. They were tasked with helping find the next quarterback of the future in Denver. What does he do? He trades for the guy with the physical gifts, with the athleticism, with the size, with the arm talent, named Paxton Lynch. It was a massive and epic fail. You then move on to San Francisco, where he becomes the assistant GM. And they're tasked with finding the guy that's going to help turn that franchise around. Very similar circumstances to the ones that they encountered here in Washington. And a lot of what they did in San Francisco, he's implementing right now. Said so himself. And I even told you before he got here or before he started doing the things that he, I said, he's going to implement a lot of those strategies here. Because the situation is very similar. When he got to San Francisco, they had the number two overall pick. They had a ton of cap space. They were coming off of an abysmal 2-14 and campaign. Okay? They had to come in and turn over the roster. They signed a bunch of one-year deals. I laid all of that out for you in a live stream a month ago. Okay? So we did all of that already. He's doing the same thing here. The only difference is, They tried to go after Kirk Cousins and our dumb, dumb organization led by the the, um, dumbass known as Dan and the Prince of Darkness, Bruce Allen, banded together and decided that they weren't going to try to help Kyle Shanahan out. Instead of thinking about it from their perspective and saying, shit, he's going to give us the number two overall pick in the draft. Maybe we can find our own quarterback. We're not going to help him out. So we'll take a compensatory third instead. What idiots. But that's no here nor there. That's the only difference is they tried to fast track that process by going out and getting a veteran that Kyle trusted. They ended up settling in on Jimmy Garoppolo and trading for him. Got to the Super Bowl in year three of that recalibration. But they knew he wasn't the guy. They needed someone better. So what did they do? They traded up and they took a guy with all the physical gifts, all the skill sets that you're looking for. The only thing he lacked was experience. He'd only played one year as a starter. The level of competition wasn't great, but forget about that. We'd seen other quarterbacks come into the league with not the greatest competition under their belt and have success joe flacco played at delaware now i get it he was at Pitt first and then he transferred to delaware but still flacco made his bones at delaware that wasn't a great level of competition he still got it done won a super bowl carson wentz played at north dakota state and was very successful early in his career before he had a mental breakdown after the injuries That said, he took the guy, and Kyle wanted Mac Jones. He wanted the slow-footed, quick-processing quarterback that was going to be extremely accurate. And Peters and the rest of the front office convinced Kyle that, you no, 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 you don't want that guy. You want the athlete. You want the, the guy with the traits. The guy that fits this offense, that's the guy you want. Now, in Adams' defense, they never really got to see if Trey Lance was going to be able to maximize his talents in Kyle's system because he was injured both years where he was going to get a shot. He was never supposed to get a shot that first year. It was still Jimmy Garoppolo's show. 
But that second year, he was going to be given the keys. And he gets hurt against the Chicago Bears. In comes Brock Purdy after Jimmy Garoppolo plays. He gets hurt. In comes this seventh-round pick, Mr. Irrelevant, Brock Purdy. A guy that is very similar to J.J. McCarthy. Good enough athlete. Does it, not going to knock your socks off with athleticism, but good enough athleticism. If it's third and seven, he can run for eight. Brock Purdy can run for eight. Accurate with the football. Makes timely throws and timely plays. Isn't afraid to take the check down. These are the things that were successful in San Francisco. Every time he took the big cut, the big swing for the athletically gifted quarterback, for the guy that was toolsy, that had all the potential in the world, it didn't work. The time that they 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 go low, right? Low risk. Looks like we got ourselves a backup here in the seventh round. That guy develops into damn near league MVP and almost a Super Bowl winning quarterback. And is in two years as a starter, but really one full year as a starter, but at having taken over in the middle of last season or the season before, uh, season prior rather, and then taking them to the NFC Championship game before, you know, messing his elbow up. And then coming back the following year and taking them all the way to the Super Bowl and coming within minutes of winning that, you end up getting a guy that everybody kind of wrote off, said that he wasn't the right answer. Same thing with Jared Goff. Same thing we're doing with J.J. McCarthy. Don't think for one second that Adam Peters, this stuff hasn't sunk into his brain and that all of those experiences that he's gone through, seeing the failure of Paxton Lynch, who was this big, athletic, strong-armed kid from Memphis that he thought all of those things could translate into a starting quarterback in the NFL and a big-time one at that. Couldn't have been further from the truth. You go get this big, athletic kid with a good arm from North Dakota State named Trey Lance, only one year of starting experience where you think he's going to be the answer, and he wasn't. Sometimes it's the guy that's staring you right in the face. That's the right answer. Even if everybody's telling you he's not the answer. It's the same thing that happened with Dan Quinn. I think he's learned from past transgressions, past mistakes. And Jaden Daniels looks like Trey Lance to him except for the experience, right? The experience is the only difference there. But if we're talking about athletic profile, should be able to make everything happen, that's that's the formula, right? Again, I'm, I, I don't have any tangible proof that this is how he's thinking. I'm just using that psychology portion of my brain to try to read the situation. When he talked about not falling in love and having recency bias, he was talking about J.J. McCarthy, but in what context? Was he talking about it from the outside perspective of him moving up to plus 400 all the way from like, I think it was, I think it was minus 2000 or something like that all the way to plus 400. You know how massive of a jump that is? What, what, what is that number? Where is my device? I still think I have that somewhere in here. I, I may have it. I may not. Um, Let's see. What, 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 let me see. Do I have it? 
If I do, it's going to be in here. Let's see. Um, no, I don't have it anymore. So I don't, I don't remember what the odds were, um, but it, it jumped massively like two days ago. And he, he talked about recency bias and we talked about that. And I think it was a veiled shot at the media and everyone else, but he might've been talking about himself. Like, I can't get sucked in to this J.J. McCarthy situation because I'm really feeling this dude, man. And he was the first one that they really, truly met with. They took him out to dinner. They haven't done that with any other prospect. And I, and I, and I don't think it's because they like J.J. McCarthy more. I just think time permitted them to be able to do that. I mean, they know they're not getting Caleb Williams, so you don't need to spend that kind of time nor the resources on that you're going to do your due diligence still but you're not whining and dining caleb williams he's not a free agent he's going to chicago and they know that okay they can't work under the assumption that he's going to chicago but in the back of their minds they know and so they're not going to spend as many resources on you know getting things done with caleb williams as they probably will with the other three but jj mccarthy's Pro Day just happened to be at a time where nothing was going on. Free agency had died down enough that they could go and take a trip out there the night before and take him to dinner. They get to know him. You know, they're talking to people that they know. Harbaugh's selling him like the, the, the new car on the showroom floor and talking about all of his features. And, you know, hey, look, man, you're not going to find another car in the market that can do all the things that this car can do. Right, Harbaugh selling him hard. It just so happens that the LSU Pro Day is the day after the league meetings. So you don't have the night before to take, you know, Heisman Trophy winning quarterback Jaden Daniels out to dinner. You're getting on a flight from Orlando to take you down to Baton Rouge. So you don't have the time. Word out on the street is they're going to take Drake May to breakfast. I mean, that's cool. But similar, similarly, you're leaving LSU and you're going to North Carolina. So everything's kind of crammed. But I think that, and, and I've said this already, when it comes to these situations with, with players, in particular, heading into the draft. There's this consensus that all the talking heads and the prognosticators and the draft beatniks and, you know, all of us at home, how we feel. And then it's how real evaluators, coaches, and, and front office staff and personnel feel as they start to dig into the tape. That's when you start to see shit shift. And all of a sudden it go from this way of thinking to this way of thinking or that way of thinking. We were here at first. Now Adam Peters and Dan Quinn have finally dove into the tape and started to see some things. And now it's starting to go in this direction or it's starting to go in that direction. I think Adam Peters and Lance Newmark want J.J. McCarthy. Right now. Now, again, they still got a lot of work to do with Jaden Daniels. Same with J.J. McCarthy. And they haven't even gone to uh, Drake May's pro day yet. And that'll happen tomorrow. And then they're going to meet with him and they're going to see him and they're going to talk to his coaches and they're going to get a feel for him. And, and, and so there's a lot to do still in this process. Who's going to win out is ultimately what and, and are they going to be able to come to a consensus? They they say that it's a consensus, but that's not always how it ends up. Sometimes the vote wins 
or you get overruled and um, a decision gets made. Not everybody's always on board, but collectively as a group, we make a decision. So we'll see what happens. My money right now is still that the pick won't be J.J. McCarthy, but I'm starting to have conversations internally with myself that, bro, J.J. McCarthy may be the selection and you need to start opening your mind to that possibility. I've been so dismissive of him and Daniel Jeremiah keeps repeating himself. And I hate when people do this because I start going back in my mental Rolodex of times where I tried to shoo something away that I didn't want. And people kept telling me, bro, I'm trying to tell you, the warning signs are here. And I ran through stop signs. I ran through red lights. And all of the signs were there. And the, the very thing that I claimed that to not want happened. And so I'm getting those feelings again, like, uh-oh. People keep trying to tell me, hey, J.J. McCarthy's, this is, this is no smoke that you get every draft year. This isn't Will Levis from last year. This kid isn't falling to the second round. All right. That might be Bo Nix. That might be, you know, um, Michael Penix Jr. Those guys may fall to the second round. This ain't that, though. J.J. McCarthy is legitimately in the conversation for number two overall. And you need to start taking that into consideration for real. And that's what I'm having. That I'm having that conversation with myself. Daniel Jeremiah, I, I think I have the quote from DJ. See if I, if I still have it. I think I do. I've may, I may have gotten rid of it. Daniel Jeremiah says, J.J. McCarthy's rise in popularity, it, popularity is not a smokescreen. It's real. And the thing that scares me is DJ, Daniel Jeremiah, his comp for J.J. McCarthy was Alex Smith. And I'm like, this is what I've been saying. I don't want Alex Smith. We had him before, okay? We had Alex Smith. We know what that looks like. Now, I will say this. And I think I said this on my breakdown of J.J. McCarthy. He's more willing to take risk and make some big-time throws than Alex Smith ever was, okay? That said, that's who he is. That's in his DNA. You can't change a tiger's stripes, right? You can't turn him into something he's not. J.J. McCarthy is who he is. Now, I may go back and watch more. Maybe I need to watch more. Maybe I didn't watch enough. But I think I got a good handle on who he is. But I think the coaching staff wants Jaden Daniels. I think the front office is leaning towards J.J. McCarthy. Where does Drake May fit in in all of this? I still think he's got the highest upside of any of those quarterbacks. And if you listen to Adam Peters talk about, hey, the guy that we draft doesn't necessarily have to be ready and doesn't have to play right away because we have Marcus Mariota. Again, this is the thing I, I struggle with this time of the year, if we're being candid. And when I usually come closer into the camera, I'm, we're being candid, right? I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you directly. Smoke screens are for those teams that need a diversion. Right or wrong? If I'm sitting at one, do I need to, do I need to fool you? Do I need to try to trick you? Who's drafting in front of me? Nobody. So why do I need to play the game, right? Like last year, I never understood why people thought Carolina 
was leaning towards Will Levis. They never gave any indication of anything other than Bryce Young, which is why I never moved off the spot. They didn't need to try to sell you on, hey, we may go here, we may go there. We got the first pick, bro. We don't have to throw you a curveball. We don't need to keep you guessing to see if we can get you to bite over here when we really want to go over there. We don't have to do that. We don't have to play that game. The Bears are going to take Caleb Williams. We don't need to play the deceptive game, right? Hey, slide a hand. Look over here when we really try to go over here, right? We don't have to play that game. Nobody else is drafting ahead of us but the Bears, and we already know who they're selecting. So I struggle with smoke screens when you're at two, and it's already been decided that the team in front of you is, is making this selection over here. And people can try to debate, debate and come up with ulterior motives and theories as to what the Bears or the league might want, this, that. And guess what? Caleb Williams is going number one overall to the Chicago Bears. The minute they traded Justin Fields, that was written in magic marker. It was etched in stone. That shit has set, it is dried, and it is in the cement on the sidewalk. Justin Fields gone. Caleb Williams will be the number one overall pick. So we don't have to play that game. So when Adam Peters says, hey, our quarterback doesn't necessarily have to start right away. We got Marcus Mariota. None of us really believe that, right? Nobody, you didn't bring Marcus Mariota here to start. You brought him here to mentor whomever you draft at two, right? But just try this on for size. What if they do view Drake May as a project? And I know that's a word that scares a lot of people. That's a nasty word. It's dirty. It makes you feel filthy. You need to take a shower. I've had so many people say, you can't take a project at two. Well, why the hell not? All projects are not created equal. All projects don't have to be worked on the same amount of time. There's a big difference between a first round project and a seventh round project. They are not the same. Not even close. So let's, Patrick Mahomes was a first round project. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Because if he wasn't, and this and this has nothing to do with Alex Smith, it had everything to do with a hey, Patrick. Go back and watch Patrick Mahomes at Texas Tech. A lot of y'all don't even know what Patrick Mahomes was doing at Texas Tech. You weren't even watching the draft like that back then. There's a reason Mahomes didn't go first, didn't go second. There's a reason that he went 10th and they had to trade all the way up from like 27 to get him. If teams knew Patrick Mahomes was going to turn into Mahomes, he wouldn't have gone 10th. Mitchell Trubisky wouldn't have gone ahead of him and been the first quarterback selected in that draft. Patrick Mahomes was a loose cannon at Texas Tech. He was running around like a chicken with his head cut off, flinging the bitch 50, 60 yards down the field. It looked like backyard football. Seriously. He was unrefined and he needed work. He was a project. They sat his ass down for an entire season. And I'm not saying that's what we plan to do and that's what works because, again, as I've said before, there's no science. There's no art to this. Okay? If there were, then there would be a template. There would be a manual and teams would follow it. And the success rate when you draft a quarterback in the first round, in the top 10, in the top five would be a lot higher. But it's not because every situation is different. But what I'm telling you is just because you hear the word project doesn't mean that that guy can't turn into a star quarterback. Josh Allen was a project when he was drafted by the Buffalo Bills. People said, oh, that completion percentage, you can't fix that. You can't fix it. Oh, yeah. 
Try me for size. How's that completion percentage looking these days? And, and, and don't give me the, well, what is Josh Allen one? A lot of goddamn football games. That's what. You'd kill to have Josh Allen. I damn sure would. I can't speak for you. So I said all of that to say this. What if? What if? They are considering. Adam Peters said it himself. Hey, we don't have to start the rookie quarterback right away because to me, if you draft J.J. McCarthy, if you draft Jaden Daniels, those are guys that I think without a doubt, I, I think you're starting whomever you draft week one, day one. That's the way I view it. But of the three, Drake May is the youngest, if I'm not mistaken. I think he's younger than J.J. McCarthy. I don't think they're that far apart, though. You know, McCarthy is relatively young. He was uh, a three-year guy, if I'm not mistaken, at Michigan, just like May is, right? Both of them are, if I'm not mistaken, again, two-year starters. The biggest difference is McCarthy's a winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. I think he went 27 and one in his career and the one loss was in the playoffs against tcu when his defense now mccarthy wasn't exceptional and he he turned it over and he made mistakes in that game but michigan couldn't get the ball in the end zone too and the defense was atrocious in that game it was horrible but that's no here nor there he's a national champion he was a winner in high school he's a winner in college and don't don't sleep on that don't discount and diminish what that means in the grand scheme of this process, being a winner. Evaluators take that shit seriously. There's only one way to learn how to win, and that's to win. J.J. McCarthy's done that better than any of the quarterbacks in this draft class. He's tied for the most winningest coach or, or, or quarterback, I think, or he's second, I think, in college football history behind some guy we never heard of from like the 1950s who I think went undefeated. So I'm not saying, I'm just saying, we have no idea what they're going to do. There's still a lot of process left to go. I said all of that to come around in this big ass circle to come all the way back around to this. Don't let this pro day of Jaden Daniels steer you in one direction or the other. If you were on the fence, this shouldn't be enough to knock you over the fence in the opposite direction or push you over the fence in the direction towards drafting him. At the end of the day, you're going to feel how you, you're going to feel. If you're, if you're pro Jaden Daniels, this pro day didn't change your mind. If you are against drafting Jaden Daniels, then you're going to use this as more ammunition. This was a horrible pro day. And what about his elbow? Did you see his elbow? And you're going to start to pick at all of that stuff. If you like him, did you see how he was interacting with Malik neighbors after he ran his 40? Did you see that he had on the shirt of his teammate that had cancer do you see all of these things? Did you hear all of the things that were said about him that, you know, they were gushing about this guy? It, they could go in a multitude of ways. We're along for the ride. Enjoy it. Enjoy the ride. I know I am. I'm going to enjoy this thing. Um, for the first time in a long time, I have no idea what we're going to do in the first round. I know what position we're taking. I have no clue. None. I, I haven't moved. I would take Drake May. That would be my pick. If you put a gun to my head right now and you forced me to make a selection for this team, what I think they're going to do, I would tell you dot, 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 dot. And that takes me to this next thing that I'm going to tell you. So I'm out of the office after tonight's show. Won't be back until next week. So with that said, 
I want to leave you some viewing material. You know, I, I don't like to leave you guys naked, afraid, and alone. Okay. So I'm going to leave this video here. Let this one kind of marinate a bit on Thursday. And then Friday, I'm coming at you strong. I got my my first two. I'm gonna do it a little different this year. Normally, I'm 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 a two weeks out kind of guy because I I'm looking for accuracy. I want to see those thirty visits. I want to see what they're looking at, what they're aiming for, and then I want to put out my mock. I'm not doing that this year. I want to have some fun with it because I have no idea what they're gonna do. Right? I don't know this group. As I get a feel for their movements and and how they operate. I, all I can do is go off of their past. All I can do is go off of what Adam Peters did in San Francisco and, you know, what Lance Newmark did in Detroit. And that's how I'm going to formulate some of the decisions that I've made um, and, and what Dan Quinn did in Dallas and things of that nature and what kind of players I think they're looking for. But with that said, Friday, I'm dropping my mock draft, Washington seven round mock draft on you. I've got two. One with trades, one without trades. You tell me which one you like best. Um, those will be dropping on Friday. Have at it. Devour it. Pick it apart. We'll come back and talk about it, obviously, next week. Right? It's going to be fast and furious in April. It's all draft, all gas, no breaks, all draft. Okay? We don't have any more free agency to discuss. We don't have nothing else is slowing us down. Once the calendar turns to April, it's all draft all the time on the Louis T network, unless something happens cataclysmically that steers us in a different direction. And that just doesn't happen in the month of April when it comes to the NFL, it's all draft all the time. And that's what we're going to be, but we're going to put the bow on free agency and everything that has come with it in April, in March rather. And I'm going to drop those mock drafts. And then I got another video for you. And um, that one will come out probably on Saturday. And, and that should get you through till Monday. All right, you'll have some stuff to view uh, while I'm out of the office. And um, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just say this. I think I put a lot of thought into this seven round mock that I've put together that I've crafted with the trades, without the trades. And um, it's going to be pretty interesting. You'll, I think you're going to enjoy it. But I said all of that to say we have no idea. Me in particular. Think about it from this perspective. If you've been with me, shout out to those of you who have been rocking with the kid for the last three years plus, right? Let's go back three years. Four years. We can go all the way back to Rivera's first draft. I've given you the first round pick every single year. I told y'all Chase Young. We all knew Chase Young. That, that wasn't a secret. We all knew he was the pick at two. 2021, I told y'all it was Jamin Davis. <laughs> I told y'all it was Jamin. And we had fun because we said, hey, he's got the military background. You know, he, he tore up the pro day. That was the year. It was COVID. Nobody was going anywhere. So it was easy to, for you to go light it up at a pro day. And he, he almost felt like a myth. Because it started out, oh, shit, Jamin Davis ran a 4-3-40. Then it was a 4-4-1 or whatever. Then it was like a 4-4-7. I don't even remember what it ultimately ended up being. It, it felt like an urban legend almost. It was mythical. He ends up being the first round pick. He did not have the, the film, the production, the chops, none of that. They took him anyway. And I told y'all they were going to take him. The next year in 2022. We knew they were going receiver. We even we even predicted the trade back. I was off by, I think, a pick or two. Now, I didn't see us taking Jahan Dotson, but I had us taking receiver. I had us trading back. All of that. I had the Eagles getting um, the defensive tackle from Georgia, Jalen Carter, in that trade. It was crazy, right? Now, I think the Eagles didn't have to trade to get him, but they got him. But that's no here nor there. We knew they would take a receiver. We just didn't know which one. We know they're taking quarterback. 
We know they're not trading. But we have no idea. I am literally going to be on the edge of my seat come April 25th, unless something comes out between now and then that kind of uncovers the thought process that Washington has going into the number two overall pick. And I'd like to think that we'll have a better sense of where they're leaning by the time the draft gets here. But the way this, do you understand that they've signed two free agents this period? We I've never seen this before, by the way, at least here in Washington. I can't speak for what other teams do and how they operate. When's the last time? This is how tight-lipped they've been. When's the last time? Ian Rappaport, Adam Schefter, Tom Pelissero, none of these guys. Mike Garofolo, nobody had the Michael Davis signing. We woke up and this man was on live. He was on live on YouTube talking about signing the beat reporters didn't have it kime didn't have it ben standing didn't have it nikki javala didn't have it we found out when this man was talking to us about signing with the commanders and as he's talking adam schefter ian rapaport reports that michael davis is signed in washington dog we're watching the shit on our tv screen right now we're watching the shit on our mobile devices and on our computers Duh, you didn't break this. They broke it to us. Was the last time that shit happened here where we didn't know five years before some shit happened? Michael Dieter signed here the other day. That shit was on the team site. That's how Nikki Javala reported it. It was on the team site. First. They ain't saying shit, okay? They shit is zipped up, they locking it away, and they throwing a key. So if this continues, we won't know a damn thing until that pick is announced. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Keep the suspense right where it is. Keep doing your homework. Keep being diligent. Adam Peters said, this is why you have to go through the full process. You have to go through the full process. It's exciting. It's nerve wracking because this is such a big decision. If you don't get this one right, all of this kind of feels like it's being done in vain. But I challenge you, for those of you out there that say, it doesn't really matter, all this that they're doing, it doesn't matter. If they don't get this pick right, it doesn't matter. On one hand, you're not wrong. But this is how I challenge you. And this is what I say. The San Francisco 49ers built up their football team. They built it up because they thought Trey Lance could take them where they ultimately wanted to go. Now, they had success before he even got there with Jimmy Garoppolo. They made it to the Super Bowl. And if Garoppolo... Um, you know, if I think it was Jaquaski Tart could catch a, a punt, which that interception was like a punt, they probably go to another Super Bowl with Jimmy Garoppolo at quarterback instead of the Rams going and ultimately beating the Cincinnati Bengals. But that's not here nor there. The bottom line is they built that roster up. And they were hoping that Trey Lance could take it where it wanted to go. And ultimately, they lucked up and found their guy in Brock Purdy now. Kyle Shanahan's a special dude. And we don't have Kyle Shanahan. We have Cliff Kingsbury, just in case you were taking score and keeping notes at home. That said, the reason why they were able to transition seamlessly to Brock Purdy is because they built the roster up and they dropped the quarterback in. Something I've been talking about for four years with Ronald Rivera here is build the infrastructure of the roster, build that ecosystem, as I like to call it, and then you drop the quarterback in and you're ready to rock. 
So all of this won't be in vain, even if they don't get this pick correct. What it does is it delays the process. But who knows how you find your quarterback? They may say, you know what? Let's go get our quarterback via trade. Let's go get one of these veterans that's going to help you win because the team is ready. It, it's not that different than what we're watching the Jets try and do right now. The Jets had a damn good team, and they were being held back by the quarterback position. So what did they do? They went out and they drafted Zach Wilson. He'll be the one that, that gets us over the hump. We got a good football team here. We got the best defense in the league the year before. Let's go get Zach Wilson. He'll change everything. He changed nothing. They drafted Garrett Wilson. They went out and got all these free agents. They added all this talent, Corey Davis at receiver and all these tight ends. They had all this talent offensively, defensively, nothing. So what did they do? They said, to hell with this quarterback shit in the draft. Let's go get Aaron Rodgers. We're going to see what happens, right? Obviously, the injury derailed that last year. He'll be back again next year. Let's see what happens. The Los Angeles Rams. They built the team. They built the infrastructure. They built that ecosystem. And then they said, Jared Goff is going to take us where we need to go. And he was a part of that process. Too. They, they didn't build it and then go get Jared Goff. He was a part of that rebuild. When he got there, they were the worst team in football. And slowly but surely, brick by brick, they got Sean McVay and they built that thing into a winner. And then they got to a point similar to the 49ers with Alex Smith, where they realized same thing with the Kansas City Chiefs. This guy can only take us but so far. And so they went out and got a veteran. And all, I said all of that to say this. There's no telling what's going to happen at two and whether we're going to be successful at two or not. But it is important that you continue to build this roster no matter what. You hope to be successful with the quarterback. It alleviates so much strain and so much strife and so many problems that exist when you don't have that position taken care of. But what good is a team if you got a great quarterback and the supporting cast isn't, isn't up to, to speed? Then you have Justin Herbert. That's what you have. And I've, you know, I've seen people taking shots at Justin. What is Justin Herbert one? Have you watched the Chargers? Have you watched the Los Angeles Chargers? If you haven't, then shut your mouth. Okay. Don't speak on Justin Herbert's name. Okay. But if you've watched them and you know the circumstances surrounding, then you would know it ain't Justin Herbert's fault that they haven't won anything of note. Anyway, one more thing on, on Jaden Daniels before we get to the comment section. He weighed in at 210 pounds. For a, a lot of people, that was where he need that was the baseline. That's where he needed to get to even start a conversation. He was asked by, I want to say it was ESPN, might have been NFL Network. What's the most asked question you've received during this process? How much you weigh? What's your weight? What's your weight looking like? So that's a thing. That's a real thing. It exists. We've all seen the car wrecks that he's gotten into throughout his collegiate career. Here's what I say. Because I hear people, oh, this guy's going to get broken up. Oh, my God. He's worse than Robert Griffin III. No, he's not. Stop it. Robert Griffin III came to us as damaged goods. He had a torn ACL already. Okay? Robert Griffin III didn't know how to protect himself in or outside of the pocket. Jaden Daniels has been ragdolled. We've seen it with our own eyes. He's taken some massive shots. Guess what he's always done? i give you a guess. Outside of the one where he took a helmet-to-helmet -helmet shot that nobody was getting up from. And he did get up, but he didn't finish the game because he had a concussion. And I don't give a shit who you were. You take that kind of a hit to the helmet, you're not finishing the game either. That didn't have nothing to do with being 200 pounds. That had everything to do with 
helmet to helmet blow, you're done. But the car wrecks we've seen him get into, whether he's jumping over somebody in the Florida State game, I don't know what the hell he was thinking, where he thought he was going to go. I don't know if he thought he had just had a Red Bull and he grew wings and he was about to fly, but they quickly reminded him, keep your goddamn feet on the ground and lit his ass up. Or the old Miss game where he gets mollywhopped and he flies backwards five yards and the ball goes in the opposite direction three yards. I can keep going. There are countless hits that he took. He always got up. So this notion that he's going to be broken, he's too small, it's hogwash. But it's good to know that he put on a little bit of weight. For those of you crying at home, he's 210 pounds. Oh, he's still skinny. J.J. McCarthy is going to be 215 pounds roughly. Different frame, I'll grant you that. He's not as angular and tall. But J.J. McCarthy's no shrimp. He's probably 6'3", 215. That ain't that much different than 6'4", 210. Again, different frame. I'm aware. I'm fully aware. I just said all that to say this. It's not like Jaden Daniels was out here playing two-hand touch or he was playing in some cockamamie, you know, conference. He wasn't playing in the SWAC. No disrespect to the SWAC, by the way. That was very disrespectful, actually. Sorry. <laughs> Shame on me. Of all the conferences I could have picked, I should have said the Sun Belt. I feel bad. I feel dirty. I need a bath. He played in the SEC, bro. Like, what are we talking about? Those guys, that's the step down from the NFL. So don't, don't tell me he can't withstand the rigors of the NFL. He's done it his entire life. He's been this size everywhere he's been, every step of the way, and he hasn't incurred injury. So, again, knock on a little bit of wood. So he weighed in at 210 pounds. For those of you that that matters for, there you go. Anyway, I digress. Let's get to the comment section. See what you guys have to say. Um. Who's cooking? Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. Who writes? At this point, Lou, I just want to know what we are going to do with the later picks. I'm already bored talking about quarterback, laughing my ass off. Hope all is well. HTTC. Um, that's why I don't talk about it as much. The only reason we're even having this conversation is because of his pro day today. And if I was here tomorrow um, in office, we'd probably be talking about Drake May's pro day tomorrow. And we'd be talking about the quarterback position again. But I'm over it. I've already given you my stance. It's not going to change. I prefer Drake May. I've made that abundantly clear. I'm cool with whomever they take, Sands for J.J. McCarthy. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to come around to the idea of J.J. McCarthy because that's real. That's not for play play. That's not for show. That's a real thing. That's brewing, bubbling under the surface. J.J. McCarthy is no longer uh, a long shot. He's no longer separated into that second group that we tried to put him in, right? It was the top three quarterbacks, and then it was the second wave, and that second group was led by J.J. McCarthy, Bo, and then it was Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. You can put those two in whatever order you want behind J.J. McCarthy. That's how it was fed to us, and that's how we've looked at it, and the, the prism and the lens that we've viewed it from this entire time. Well, now that the evaluators have stepped in and the coaches and, and the front office personnel have stepped in and started watching film, that's no longer the case. And now J.J. McCarthy is creeping up ever so slowly but slowly but surely like the tortoise he's creeping up to that first group and he's saying hey where y'all going and they're like nah man you ain't coming with us don't worry about where we going he's like well shit i'll just follow y'all then it don't matter you don't gotta like me you just mad because i tell it how it is and you tell it how it might be he coming whether you like it or not now whether he ends up here or not 
remains to be seen, but I've already made it abundantly clear how I feel. So I don't need to continue to beat a horse that's been long dead, okay? Nothing's going to change. We don't know anything. We don't have any more information. So all you're doing is talking in circles. I don't want to report rumors because those aren't reports. They're rumors. So I say I tend to stay away from that stuff, right? Let, let everybody else talk about that stuff. I want to talk about more concrete stuff or more topics that are interesting. As you mentioned, we do have other picks. Nine, we have nine total, eight more picks other than the first uh, pick in, in, you know, the second pick overall in the draft, to be exact, that we can discuss. We're not taking eight quarterbacks in this draft, just one. So, yeah, um, I could see how you could be fatigued already. If you're fatigued already, I feel bad for you. <laughs> I, I feel bad for you, son. You got 99 problems, and this quarterback conversation ain't going away. So you got a big one, right? This is going to be the thing that they're going to talk about the most ad nauseum as we head towards the end of April. The Real Benjamin, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Who writes, May's best games were versus Campbell University and Georgia Tech trash football schools. If you take away those, he is 18 over nine touchdown to interception, below 50% QBR. Take away JD's two best games. He's still 30 touchdowns over four um, interceptions. JD is 1B in terms of QBs in this draft. Um, it's easy to play the what if game. I, I used to always bring this up. When somebody does that, I always go back to my uh, Greg Minuski days when he would talk about this, this run defense isn't that bad. If you just take away the 170 yard run we gave up. Well, hey, newsflash, old Mr. Cracking Skulls, right? Striking iron. Guess what? You do count that 70 yard run. Okay. So yeah, we did give up 200 and 12 yards rushing. And and also newsflash bozo, even without the 70 yard run, we gave up 147 yards on the ground, which would have still equaled out to 4.7 yards a pop. We were getting gashed before the 70 yarder, but carry on. All right. Go on. Do your thing, Wody. Wody. So I, I don't like to play that game. If you take away this, no, you can't take away those games. They happen. And yes, those aren't powerhouse schools. But I did see a stat. Again, numbers can be manipulated to fit whatever narrative you want them to fit, right? I did see a stat against power five schools. Again, take it how you want to take it. Drake May has the highest QBR of any of the quarterbacks. His was like 90 point something and like 90.8. And Drake and Caleb Williams was like 90.5. And then the rest of them were somewhere in the 80s. And then uh, I think Jaden Daniels was in the 70s, right? Now, the, the easy remedy and fix for this is, well, look at the conference he played in. Duh. That's why I said numbers can be misleading and they can be manipulated. People say people lie. Numbers don't. Right. People lie or numbers, you know, numbers don't lie. People do, right? I hear that shit all the time. No, you can make numbers tell a whole different story. You can make numbers say whatever the hell you want them to say if you prop them up and put them in a specific context. Just like that, that graphic I saw. Of course, his numbers against Power 5 schools are going to be better. He played in the ACC. And not to shit on the ACC, but you're going to play a lot better against NC State in UVA, in Georgia Tech. Yeah, I'd, I'd imagine that that's going to be a lot easier than playing against Auburn, playing against Georgia, playing against Alabama. I'm pretty sure it's easier to play against um, to play against I'm trying to think of a low-level ACC school. Boston College. It's much easier to go torch BC than it is to go beat up on Ole Miss. So, again, we can play that game if we want. I, I'm, I don't like playing that game. 
at the end of the day, just just stand on business. Believe what you believe because you want to believe that. Like, don't try to sell me on JD's better because of this stat or that stat. If you think he's better, just say, I think he's better because his athleticism is unmatched in this draft. He's a playmaker. He won the Heisman Trophy, and he did it in the toughest conference. Just, just stand on that. Just stand on that. Again, we don't have to throw rocks and then try to hide our hand. Like, we don't got to do that. You don't have to prop up JD by diminishing what Drake May did. Like, you don't have to do that. You can. That's why we call it a civil war, because y'all are fighting for no reason. Caleb Williams, uh, Caleb, uh, Drake May is not the enemy. Jaden Daniels is not the enemy. So you don't have to fight this guy over here, and you don't have to be a fan of this guy over here and be fighting each other as if that's going to solve something. Because guess what? Somebody is going to be drafted here. If it ain't J.J. McCarthy, it could be crazy that we got the Civil War going on and then this guy that's not even involved ends up being the, the pick. That would be actually laughable. But if we are to assume that one of the guys – in the Civil War, J, uh, you know, Jaden Daniels or Drake May is the pick. Some part of the fan base is going to be pissed off. And that's my issue, is that whomever doesn't get picked, the fans that were riding for that quarterback, diminishing the other quarterback's, you know, career and, and poke, poking holes in his game because they don't want him. They want him. To, what does that solve? All it does is make you not like the other quarterback, and that may be the guy that you should be rooting for that you might end up having to root for, or maybe you don't if you're one of those types of fans that want to be right more than you want to see the team succeed. What does that do? What, what is Where's the psychological sense in that? It just That doesn't make sense to me. I'll never understand that. Like, I don't – look, I don't want J.J. McCarthy. I told you why. I'm not diminishing him. People that have watched him, just like I have, just like you have, have all said the same thing. He's Alex Smith. I don't want Alex Smith. You know why I can say that? I watched him quarterback here. So I know I don't want Alex Smith. But guess what? If they draft J.J. McCarthy, which is why I'm not going to sit here and badmouth him, because guess what? If they draft J.J. McCarthy, guess what? I instantly become a J.J. McCarthy fan. Didn't want him. He's here. What are you going to do about it? Same thing that happened with Dwayne Haskins. Never wanted him. Wanted to steer clear of him like he was the plague. They drafted him. Guess what? I'm a Dwayne Haskins fan. I had no choice. Christopher McLaughlin, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. Truly do appreciate you, my guy, Chris. Thank you for gifting 10 memberships. Can't thank you enough for your generosity. Shout out to all of you who have become members because of the generosity of one, Chris McLaughlin. Brian Hill, speaking of new members, stand up. You are the newest member of the MOBB mob. Y'all know what to do. Show Brian Hill some love, welcome him with open arms, show him what it's like to be a member of the MOBB. Brian Hill, welcome to the squad. Welcome aboard, glad to have you. Excuse me, Christopher McLaughlin, my guy, Chris. Thank you for the super chat, greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. My guy, Chris writes, hey Lou, what's up, Chris? Hope all is well with you and the family, likewise. Um, and that you have a blessed Easter, again, likewise. Hopefully you and yours enjoy um, the Easter holiday. He writes, um, two questions. One, how comfortable would you feel if Lucas starts at right tackle and why? And two, what positions or BPA do you want Peters to draft in rounds four and five and why? Um. I'd be very comfortable with Cornelius Lucas starting. I've already made that abundantly clear. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen this or not, 
Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I know some of you have. And I told you guys, I'm always on the Washington Commanders website, always. It's always up there, whether I'm looking for a video, checking to see it, because now they're they're so secretive. So you got to go to the website sometimes for information, right? So <laughs> I'm always up there and, you know, just kicking around stuff. Sometimes I go just to check the roster, you know, and now that you have new players, whether it's to check out a jersey number or to see how they have them listed. You just go around just to see what's what. And a number of you have pointed this out. Shout out to all of you who uh, dropped that in the comment section of the last two videos. Um, but they have Sam Cosme listed as a tackle. I don't know if y'all caught wind of that. They have Andrew Wiley listed as guard slash tackle. So... I told you guys, don't be surprised if Sam Cosme is being kicked back outside. I wouldn't have done that personally, but um, I'm not saying that that's etched in stone and that he's not going back inside. But again, just something to think about, just a little food for thought. You do the dishes. So there could be a scenario in which Cornelius Lucas starts at one tackle, Sam Cosme starts at the other, and you draft a rookie, but he doesn't start at all. And I've seen more rookie tackles not start. The Steelers drafted the Georgia tackle last year, like 14th overall, you know, something to that effect. He did not start the first eight weeks of the season. It wasn't until Chooks uh, a for got into an, uh, uh, you know, a little scuffle at the end of a game last year and then voiced his displeasure with the Steelers staff where they had disciplined him and benched him for the following week's game. The rookie stepped in, played well, and they say, you ain't getting your damn spot back. So again, I see rookie tackles taken all the time in the first round and they don't start. Um, and it could happen again. So just understand that Sam Cosme is listed as a tackle and you will hear me talk about that, um, several more times, but I would be very, very okay with Cornelius Lucas starting at tackle left or right. I think he's probably better suited for the uh, right side, but would make me one bit of difference. What side? Because we may draft a natural right tackle in the draft. Okay, not wanna, you don't want to flip that guy in his first season. You want him to start, keep him on the right side. Okay, Cole Luke, you go over there and you start at left tackle. So, again, we'll see what happens. Um, as far as the fourth or fifth rounds, those mid-rounds, early, you know, early day three, um, at that point of the draft, and, and it's funny because in, in the mock, I spent a lot of time on these mock drafts, man. <laughs> I did my homework. I did my research. And I, I really put a lot of thought into it. And as you get to those mid-rounds, shit gets really interesting. I don't want to give anything away. but I, I and, and here's the thing. These mock drafts are fun to do, and I see why people do them. Uh, they're still an exercise in futility, but they're fun, right? Here's the thing. We don't know how the draft is going to fall. Some of these mock drafts that I did, I started them over because I'm like, bro, there's no way that shit is happening. I, I need realistic mock drafts. not Because you don't see all the shit that's being done. Like People send me mock drafts all the time. He's like, I had one person send me a, you know, a, a message. And he was like, bro, you can't believe what I was able to pull off. In this mock draft, and he, he sent me all these crazy trades that he's like, What do you think about this? And I'm like, I didn't even respond. And if you're out there, I didn't respond because it was too far fetched. It was too much. It was too much, right? I just looked at it. I cut my eyes like, first of all, I've already said multiple times, I don't care about mock drafts. You guys know this. I've already said it. I'm already jaded by them. So, um, you get to those mid rounds though, and it gets interesting because every year 
one of the things that I see, if you ask me what's the biggest misnomer about the draft is that a lot of players get overrated. And there's this prevailing thought that this player or that player or this position is going to go here or there. And you just assume you fall into the trap of thinking, oh, this guy's not going to be there. Prime example is in my mind, and I think I'm right. Xavier Leggett's not going to make it to the third round. In my mind. that's. But guess what? That's in my mind. The league may think differently about Xavier Leggett. They may see the one year of production. They may see that he's not a great route runner. They may see that he's a little rough around the edges and there's parts of his game that are undeveloped. And they may say there are other guys in this draft that are just better than him. Period. And he may be there in the third round. Or there could be one, all it takes is one team to say, hey, he looks like A.J. Brown to me, and they take his ass. And that's what I think is more likely to occur. So I said all of that to say this. You get to those mid-rounds, and it's a lot of shit that you can do. And it's a lot of, and you know, it's funny because I'm going to save that for the mock drafts that I did. But I'll just say this. Shit's going to get interesting on day three for Washington. One, we don't have a fourth round pick. Not yet, at least. We'll see if that changes or not. But even if we don't, and we don't make a selection in the fourth round, we got three third round picks. And the beauty of our final pick is it's the very last pick in the third round. So it almost feels like, I know when I was doing the mock draft, it felt like a fourth round pick because it was so late in the third, but it's going to, it's going to feel like we don't have a fourth round pick because day three is on a different day than day four, five, six, and seven or, or rounds four, five, six, and seven rather. So it, it, there's a cutoff there and you see that like we don't get to leave after 78 it, in years past if you were a commanders fan you could tune out after the pick is turned in in the third round and then you can go look at that guy that they selected go watch a couple of highlights from him and see how you feel about him or whatever you can't do that this year we have the final pick in the third round so you got to stick around until that baby is over so yeah, um, it's going to be fascinating. I want everything to be BPA, if at, if at all possible. I would like everything to be somewhat BPA. It, it, everything can't be BPA, but I would like a lot of things to be BPA. Lang Hughes, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Lang Hughes writes, Smart GM will look at his own history and league history, and that's how you miss out on a quarterback from Texas Tech, Pat, Wyoming, Allen, and Oregon, Herb. And, and this is why I won't move off of Drake May because I was a big Josh Allen fan, and I didn't move off of Josh Allen. Now, I also liked um, – I also liked – Um, the UCLA Josh Rosen that year. I like the two Joshes in that draft. Baker was, his tape was clean <laughs> that year, but I didn't like Baker's size, but Baker had some gamer in him and you could see it. I loved his tape against Georgia in the Rose Bowl that year. Even though they lost, it was a hell of a game. And so you could see he had some dog in him, did Baker. I didn't think it would be enough to get him the number one overall pick, but I, I, I like Josh Rosen. I think he ended up in a pretty shitty situation, but he 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 didn't handle it well, and I, I don't think he was going to succeed wherever he went, but um, he definitely didn't have a chance going to Arizona. They were a train wreck and a dumpster fire then. But any guy that, that gets drafted and the first thing he wants to do is point his finger and wag at the teams that didn't select him, that guy's probably going to fail epically in the league like Dwayne Haskins did, God rest his soul, and, and Josh Rosen did, right? When when the league done messed up because they didn't take you, 
And and instead of you being grateful for the opportunity you've been given, and you, you the first thing you want to do is spit vitriol, you're probably going to end up stinking in the lake. So the way I see it is I've made mistakes in the past based off of I didn't love the tape and, and not taking into consideration what I was watching and what they did have to offer, I just went off of, I don't like what I just saw. So hence that guy's not good. And, and very often we get caught up in that, but you don't know what's being coached. You don't know what's being put around them. You don't know, you don't know the half. We don't know the half. And so I've learned over the years that sometimes you just got to take into consideration that if the guy's got workable tools and traits and He's he's got everything that looks the part of an NFL player. Sometimes coaching can get the most out of that player. And that's why I'm looking at Drake Mann saying, dude's super talented. And if you believe in the coaching staff, he's the guy with the highest ceiling. It's, he doesn't have the highest floor of the uh, of the other three quarterbacks, but he has the highest ceiling. That's the guy that I'm trying to take a swing at, if that makes any sense. So, and, and I think, unfortunately for Adam Peters, he's taken swings at guys with higher ceilings and it hasn't worked out, which is why he may take the guy with a higher floor this time. If that makes any sense. Christopher McLaughlin, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Who writes? Hey, Luke, three questions. One, who do you think starts the left guard for us, Wiley or Allegretti, and why? I'll answer that right now. I'm going to go with Nick Allegretti. They signed him to a deal. That's their guy. Again, if all things are equal between he and Andrew Wiley, uh, first of all, if Cosme's kicking out to tackle, Wiley's going to right guard. That's my guess. Again, we'll see. Excuse me. Um, but it, even if there is a battle, let's say Cosme stays at right guard, they draft a tackle, and Cole Luke goes out to right tackle, and they get, get a left tackle in the draft or vice versa. And there is a battle between the two former Kansas City Chiefs. I'm taking Allegretti because that's their guy. They didn't they didn't sign Andrew Wiley. They have no ties to Andrew Wiley. Um they signed Allegretti. They like his toughness. They think he's ready to start. And I think they're going to give him every opportunity to do so. He said, number two, he says, what role do you think Quan Martin plays if we draft a, a nickel slot cornerback on day two? Um, I still think that they see a role for Quan Martin on this defense. And remember, we've talked about Dan Quinn's ability to put packages together. Uh, together to get guys on the field, which is something we just didn't see with Jack Del Rio. Either you were on the field or you weren't. There wasn't any specific packages to get other guys involved or to try to highlight guys' as strengths and put them in positions to make plays. It was just, hey, this is what we do, which is trash. But they'll find ways to get Quan Martin on the field. Um, I think they'll get him on the field as a uh, split safety. Because Chin's going to be more down around the line of scrimmage. I don't see his role being that of a guy away from the line of scrimmage. He'll be utilized as a Buffalo nickel type of player. So I think Quan Martin will be, you know, still a slot guy, even if they draft a nickel. Because what happens if somebody, a team goes four wide, right? Well, then you could bring Quan Martin in the game, even if they have a true nickel and they decide to go to that guy or they go with the Buffalo nickel look. And they got uh, Jeremy Chin down around the line of scrimmage. You can still have Quan Martin on the field. It would be a three safety look. And Quan would be maybe a split safety, right? Playing a half of the field. Or you could go cover three and he could come down and be one of those, you know, um, he could be the lurking defender over the middle of the field or he could be playing the flats. Uh, <clears throat> I, they're going to still utilize Quan Martin is what I'm telling you. Um, and then they'll get creative. And, I think you can see him blitzing a little bit more because he did that in college a little bit too. And so I think they're going to utilize him. That's one thing Quinn loves to do. He loves to blitz his corners. 
Right? It's nothing for him to come with a cat blitz. It's nothing for him to blitz his safety. These he wants to bring pressure. Um, and and sometimes it's faux pressure, which we didn't do a lot of, which is it looks like you're blitzing, but you're only bringing four. It's just coming from a different way than what you're used to seeing it come from, right? So you overload the left side. Those guys drop out only to, to bring, you know, the pressure, which is really not pressure, but it's overloaded on the right side because you slip protection to the left. And now you got more guys blocking to the left and they're blocking nobody because those guys dropped out. Now you got guys coming free on the right side. That's the genius of Dan Quinn, Joe Witt Jr., and what we expect, right? So um, I think Quan Martin's going to play a, a pivotal role. They like what they saw from Quan Martin, they, and they talked about it. So I, I would I'm, – I've already said this. I would I, – I, I'm not going to be surprised if they bypass nickel corner. I, I actually think they're going to bypass nickel corner, but we'll see. Number three, how comfortable are you with special teams with McManus as our kicker? You know what? I'm not sure about Brandon McManus. He sold me on this. McManus came in and he sold me on this. You ain't got to worry about me under 50 yards. I said, okay. And then I went and checked his numbers. He was like, hey, Google me, bro. And I did. And he's right. You don't have to worry about him under 40 yards. Now, I watched him miss a pivotal kick uh, uh, under 50 yards, excuse me. And, but I, I watched him miss a pivotal kick on a Monday night versus Cincinnati without Joe Burrow in a game in which they lost in overtime. And it was under 50. But for his career, he's pretty damn accurate in the money distance, which is what I call 40 to 49 yards, which is where the bulk of your field goal attempts are going to come from in, in the season. You know, you might kick seven field goals. You might kick seven field goals from 20 to 29 yards. You might kick 11 field goals from 30 to 39 yards. And you'll kick 17 of your field goals from 40, you know, to 49. And then you might kick six or seven from 50 to 59. You're going to kick most of your attempts from 40 to 49 because most drives that stall out are going to stall out somewhere around, you know, the 20, somewhere in the 20s. And so you end up with that 42 yard field goal, that 45 yard field goal. Um, and he's pretty been pretty accurate, but I don't trust field goal kickers, man. I've had bad experiences over the years with these guys. <clears throat> But also, a lot of my experiences that have been successful have been with veteran kickers. Because generally, what I've found in the NFL is if you get a young boy early in his career, you're more likely to get the version of him that's figuring shit out, tweaking mechanics and, you know, adjusting to the, the pressures of the NFL game and trying to figure shit out. It's always seemed to be that way for us. You know, where you go all the way back. We were David Aker's experimental team. We were that team for him to figure the shit out, then go have an illustrious career with the Eagles and then finish up with the 49ers. You know, I look at Graham Gano. I loved Graham Gano, but he just wasn't ready to be what he turned into. Now Graham Gano is an excellent kicker. Sean Sweezum was ass in Washington. Then he goes to Pittsburgh and kicks for like seven years and makes every kick under 50. The big knock on him was he just didn't have a big leg. But we knew that. But he wasn't even making the, the short kicks here in Washington. Goes to Pittsburgh and he doesn't miss shit. Because we always get them when they're young here. I can go on and on uh, 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 with these kickers. Kai Forbath, same thing, Right? Goes, I mean, I watched Kai Forbath go to three other teams and didn't miss shit. Still didn't have a leg. That was his biggest issue. But, and then obviously D-Hop. D-Hop sets a career high last year in Cleveland. Man was making 59, I think he made a 61-yard field. Like, he would have never in Washington. <laughs> he would have never. Goes to Cleveland and he can't miss was like the special teams player of the week twice. For whatever reason, we get them young and they don't figure it out with us. They figure it out after they leave here. 
maybe McManus, who's had a long career and he was really good in Denver, so he's not figuring anything out, but maybe we're the beneficiaries of his success early in his career, and, and hopefully there's still a lot left in the tank, and um, he kicks well for us. But I don't trust kickers, man. So once you once you prove to me that you're capable, I'll ride. You know that. I'll ride for you. But he's got to do it here in Washington first before I, I, I lay claim to, hey, y'all back off of Brandon McManus. We'll see. Lang Hughes. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Who writes, Purdy, experience equals take QB in the fifth, not taking JJ at two. Um, yeah, Purdy had experience. You're not wrong about that. Um, he also fits perfectly in Kyle's system, though. Um, if Brock Purdy goes anywhere else but San Francisco, I don't think we're having the conversation we're having right now. The experience was great. It's a cherry on top. It's a statistic that you can pull out if you want to um, kind of use that to hammer home a narrative or kind of slant the conversation towards a narrative of experience matters, which I think it does. But he ended up in the right spot. Who are we kidding? You know, if he would have ended up here in Washington, Brock Purdy would be a backup quarterback or not even in the league right now. He, he ends up in Carolina. We're not having this conversation. He never sees the light of day. He ended up in the perfect spot. Lang Hughes, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Who writes, and I meant drafting a fifth-round quarterback along with QB at two. Um, You could very well see them do that. Very well see them do that. I expect them to draft. I told you that already, though. I expect them to draft another quarterback. He told us that we're getting two more. Now, is it two quarterbacks in the draft? Is it one in the draft and then one after the draft? Who knows? That remains to be seen. But my money's on that seventh round pick, 222, I believe it is. My money's on that guy being a quarterback. It could be one of the two fifth rounders that we currently have. Don't rule that out. But right now, my money's on that seventh rounder being the quarterback. Kevin, the PRF. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Kevin, the PRF. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB who writes. That was a 52 minute say all of that to say this. <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> yeah. Got to put that in your Hall of Fame stats when you retire. Um, of course, that's how you bring everything into focus. Uh, even when a lot of the shit you might have just said didn't make any sense and didn't tie into anything, that's how you tie it all together. Okay. Um, what can I say? What more can I say? <laughs> you got me. Hands up. You got me. <laughs> Rail goaded. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Who writes? Drake May is being criminally underrated. He going too. I just, I just, I love how we went from Drake May, same shit that happened to Sam Howe, by the way, who at one point was viewed as the number one quarterback and was a preseason All-American Heisman Trophy watch list guy to the first game against Virginia Tech in his junior season, losing and not having a great season to a fifth round pick. And again, there were other factors that were involved there that I told you that draft class sucked and he got sucked into that. I truly believe that. But Drake May went from, man, this guy's super talented. Um, this guy has a chance to be a Heisman Trophy candidate. And then obviously, obviously Jaden Daniels goes berserk. But his numbers statistically from 2023 did not match that of 2022. Um, there are reasons for that. He had a brand new offensive coordinator. We, you know, his receivers didn't do him any favor. We could do, do, do the whole song and dance. We, we, the offensive line was trash. Um, we, we could do this if we want, but we're not, we don't need to, you know why? Because 
I don't understand how a guy goes from a top three quarterback in this draft to, oh, he stinks. He's not even a, a top five quarterback in this draft. I mean, that shit is stupid. That's I, I, that's clickbait stuff. You know, when guys say stuff like that's clickbait stuff. You, there's, there's no way you can sell me. Again, unless you want safe. If you want safe, Drake May is not your guy. Because nothing about him screams high floor. Okay, nothing. He could easily turn into Sam Darnold. But you know why the Jets swung at Sam Darnold? There was a lot of red flags on Sam Darnold coming out of SC. Again, I don't know if a lot of you were following the draft that closely back in 2018 when those quarterbacks came out. But there were issues with Sam Darnold, including turnovers. And it never went away. But you know why you swing at number three for Sam Darnold? Because the ceiling is tremendous. That's why. And again, I, I don't apologize for being aggressive at quarterback. And you live with the results, whatever they are. And that's why I'm, I'm looking at Drake May and I'm saying, I'm sorry, not sorry. I'll take Drake May. And if it's Jaden Daniels, cool, bring him on. He's super talented. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. And he's got all the, the talent that we need to try to turn this thing around and help us win. So I'm all for it. Chalk Line Challenger. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Chalk Line Challenger. Duncan Wright, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. Duncan Wright writes, how you feel about Cooper DeJean? Hey, I'm all about white corners, man. I get excited when I see him. I, 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 I feel like Iowa is the only one churning out these white boys at the cornerback position. If I'm not mistaken, it, 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 I think that's where Cooper DeJean uh, is from. Uh, DeJean is from. Let me see. Make sure. Because they had Riley Moss, what, two years ago? I think they had him. Yeah. And they, they had Riley Moss, what, two years ago, I think? And I was so excited. And now they got Cooper DeJean. And unlike Riley Moss, who I think ended up being like a third-round pick, this dude might sneak into the first round, man. Um, he's got a shot. We'll see what happens. But all in all, he's tall. He's got speed. Apparently, I I wanted I wish he wouldn't have not been injured because I wanted to see him run just to make sure. That's always the question when we get a white dude at corner. But we're not putting a white dude at corner if he can't run. I think that's kind of universally known. Like you can't be white and slow at corner. We're just gonna move you to safety. There's no conversation there. You can't hang around. So you, it, <laughs> I want to say something, but that's not appropriate. I won't say it. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll just say this. Um, I'm rooting like hell for him. And um, I want to see where he ends up. And I got to I gotta watch more film on him. I've only watched, like, I think I watched him indirectly um, in one game. You know, and he flashed a little bit. So I got to go back and watch him some more. But I like what I saw. Uh, it was it was enough for me to be like, hey, man, this dude got some skills, you know. And people have already said that he's, you know, a, a first round type talent. So clearly there's skills there. But, you know, it's Iowa. He's white. You know how that goes. So I was like, hey, man, I. I got to see this for real, but he got some skills, man. I think he's got some skills, but I got to do some more work. Uh, Swaggy P, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB who writes, I'm going to need that remote from the movie click to skip to the draft because this May versus Daniels war is getting out of hand. 
Hashtag just get the right guy. <laughs> the Civil War is ridiculous. I choose to not partake, and I really don't. Like, it's not bothering me as much as it's bothering some of you because you guys are in these Facebook groups and you're on social media all the time, so you're 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 taking in a lot of this stuff. I'm not. I I I, I stay above the noise. I only take in what I want, and I I block everything else pretty much out. So. Um, I'm not having any issues with it, but I know it exists. I'm no dummy and I'm not, you know, under a rock. I see it every day. I mean, I encounter it on these streams. So I know what's being said and what's going on, but it doesn't bother me as much to be honest with you, because I know that there's more than just that position. I'm aware of how important that position is and that pick is going to be. And that decision that they make ultimately is going to be excuse me, the decision that determines whether this team is competitive um, in terms of the division and in the conference and, and trying to win a Super Bowl in the next three to five years, or we're back in this same position potentially in three to five years. I'm aware, but, you know, building up the rest of this roster is very important too, because that's going to help aid whomever we take it to. What you do on the offensive line, is going to help that quarterback we take it to what you do at receiver helping him get weapons or at tight end or at running back is going to help him at two what you do on defense to get him turnovers to shorten the field to to stop the other team from scoring 27 so that his job isn't as hard that's going to help him too so all of it matters all of it matters Miss P, been a member for 30 months. Who writes? PSA, hit the like button, y'all. You heard the woman. All right, it's not hard, and I ain't too proud to beg. Hit the like button if you haven't already done that. Over 630 of you out there, only 230 likes. Make it make sense. Make it make sense, okay? Let's get that number up. We should be around 400, man. I know I'm not going to get every single person uh, to hit the like button, but if you're capable, all right, just hit the like button. Touch it up a little bit for me. Appreciate the PSA, Miss P. Um, Chalk Line Challenger, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Who writes? Chris, uh, question. Chris Sims saying fan base wants, needs Afro-American quarterback. I don't know what he said or didn't say. I can't vouch for that statement. But I've I've heard people in the fan base claiming that Washington needs a black quarterback. I've heard that. And it's a, a lot of those people are still mourning the loss of Robert Griffin III here in Washington. Those are the same people that loved Griffin and thought he could do no wrong. Um, but that goes all the way back to Doug Williams, right? So that's that's some deep-rooted stuff. <clears throat> I don't buy that. Look, our quarterback could be Mexican. He could be uh, uh, Hispanic. I don't give a shit. He could be Icelander Pacific or Pacific Icelander or whatever the hell it is. He could be a damn Eskimo. I don't give a shit. He could be peach. He could be golden rot. He could be maroon. I don't give a damn what color he is. I just want to win. Damn it. I don't give a shit what color he is. Uh, I, that's never crossed my mind, but there are people out there that that stuff matters to. I won't fool myself into... To thinking that that doesn't exist because it does. Calvin Krim, thank you, uh, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. My guy Cal writes, "Hey Lou, because what's up, Calvin?" Says because AP and company have been so tight-lipped. Do you think this forces the Patriots to want to trade up with us? AP may be putting us in a position to get their guy and more draft capital. 
I've already said that I think this exists. I think this opportunity, the Patriots had nine. One, two, three, four, fifth, six, seven, eight, nine. Front office, personnel, staff members at Jaden Daniels Pro Day. Now, they can have them same nine dudes at Drake Mays tomorrow. And the guess is that they will. It's a lot of that. We had four dudes that really mattered. And I'm not saying that there weren't more there, but we had Lance Newmark, Adam Peters, Dan Quinn, and Cliff Kingsbury. That's the four, right? Four horsemen. They had nine dudes. Anybody that's anybody was there. So they're going to fall in love with one of these dudes. And that's why I said we're in a great spot because you could literally fleece the Patriots, trade back one spot, and um, still get your guy, right? It's it's not out of the realm of possibility. I'll say that. Duncan Wright, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Who writes? Love you, Lou, and don't want to insult you, but does anyone actually learn anything from your channel? I'm asking because every time I listen to your podcast, I feel my brain getting smaller. You guys got this too? Uh, yeah, people learn a lot. I think that the reason that you don't learn anything is because 85% of the time that you listen to the channel, you're drunk. So a lot of that stuff doesn't stick. You're missing all of the good stuff. And when you are sober... It might be stuff that you just, you know, you don't want to hear, right? But your your brain may be shrinking for other reasons. I have nothing to do with that, okay? <laughs> just so we're clear, all right? Anyway, <laughs> uh, Calvin Crib, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. And I still love you, man. I still love you. Uh Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Um, Calvin Krim writes, Lou, hot take. We're drafting a linebacker in the third round and Jamin is traded for a day three pick. I've noticed a weird vibe whenever JD is brought up in interviews. Hmm. That's interesting. I haven't received that same vibe, but I could see something happening there. Again, Anybody that's not one of their guys and isn't a core guy is not safe. So I I wouldn't be shocked if that happened. But in my mind, they're not picking up the fifth-year option. Uh, so I've been clear about that, and I'm going to continue to to state that. But in, in saying that um, – they got one more year of, of relatively cheap labor out of Jamin Davis, and I think they're going to utilize it. So um, I don't see them trading him for a day three pick. He's more valuable to them in this final year of his rookie deal than a day three pick would be, if we're being honest. So I, while, while I don't, I wouldn't rule it out, I don't think that that's ultimately going to be the case. So we'll see. But we're going to remember that you said it. And if it comes to fruition, we're definitely going to shout you out for it. Scratch more fortune. Been a member for 29 months. Lou, have you scouted Dean Goldberry yet? No, I don't even know what position he plays. Have no clue who he is or what he's about. Um, and I may not know. You know, so many guys that I don't get to every year when it comes to the draft. And, and I don't get to them until after the draft is over. So um, he may be one of those guys. He doesn't sound like someone that will run across my my sheet of names to, to be very well versed in as we approach the draft, but we'll see. You just never know. Zo life, no life. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. 
Thank you for being a member of the MOBB who writes, Lou, I am infatuated with Chop Robinson, but like you said, we probably ain't adding an end. Gonna roll my eyes on the Ravens pick him on draft night. I wouldn't rule him out if he were to fall to the second round. Problem is, somebody's probably gonna take him in the first round. And, and that's where the disconnect is. They're not going to trade up for him. But if he falls to 34, I wouldn't rule it out. 34, 36. If he falls to 36, I wouldn't rule it out. So just, just know that everything's on the table, man. You might get to 36 and all of the tackles that you feel good about are gone. And the value simply isn't there at 36 or 40. But the value may be better at, say, 52. Well, then you package up a couple picks and you go up to 52 and you go get a guy if you feel like that's the case. Or you could just wait to the third round where you have three picks. That could happen, too. That could happen, too. The likelihood is Chop Robinson won't end up here. You're right. He probably won't end up in in a Washington commander's uniform. Mad World, stand up. You are the newest member of the MOBB. Mob, you know what to do. Show Mad World some love. Welcome in with open arms. Show them what it's like to be a member of the greatest collection of commander fans in the game mobb welcome to the squad mad world chalk line challenger thank you for the super chat greatly appreciate you chalk line challenger writes if trade two to uh, number three would you be happy with mccarthy if you trade back to three um, I don't think there's any way that I would be thrilled with McCarthy. I'd be happy with the stuff that we acquired and I would have to be okay with McCarthy being on the team. I wouldn't love it. It's going to be a hard sell for me just because I think I know, and I, and I might be wrong. I might be off on JJ McCarthy, but I think I know what he is as a player. So He's going to have to show me. There's nothing anybody can say to me. There's nothing you can show me on film that's going to change my mind. Yeah, there's some throws in there. I'm aware. I said that in my breakdown. I'm aware that there are throws in there that he makes where you go, oh, shit. Look at J.J. McCarthy. There's some ballsy gunslinger throws in there. That doesn't change the fact that he's still at his core, Alex Smith. And so he's going to have to prove it to me on the field. Yeah, you're a winner. Okay, prove it to me at the NFL level. Prove it to me again. Cool, what you did in high school. Great what you did at Michigan. Prove it again. And don't Alex Smith me win 11 games in a regular season, get to the playoffs, and then can't advance. Don't Alex Smith me either. Zo life, no life. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Who writes? Vikings coach and GM were not at JJ's pro day. Uh, again, you don't have to be at a at a player's pro day to make a selection. We've seen guys. I've heard from players where they go, yo, I that team never even talked to me during the draft period. I had no interest, no idea they were even interested in me. Now we're talking quarterback. That's a little bit different. But trust me, they're gonna talk to JJ McCarthy plenty. And <clears throat> the Vikings are interested in JJ McCarthy. I think they would prefer Drake May even more, but they're interested in JJ McCarthy. We'll see what happens. Jason Files, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. 
Jason Files, thank you for being a member of the MOBB, who writes, what's up, Lou? What's up, Jason? How's the family? They're doing well. I appreciate you for asking. Um, hopefully, uh, yours is doing well. Also, he writes, if AP likes Drake or JJ and DQ likes JP, uh, JD, <clears throat> would AP just pick who he wants or how much input will coaches have? They talked about kind of being on one accord. And I remember once upon a time, Bruce Allen would lie to us every year, but it sounded good. And he would say his favorite thing to say after the draft is we came to a Redskins decision, meaning we were all on the same page and we made a, a decision collectively as a group, which was bullshit because Bruce Allen, he wanted that power. He wanted to be in control. So he wanted to take the credit when something went well. So there was no like the Alex Smith deal. Shh, don't tell anybody I did this. You'd be quiet, right? Didn't even tell, you know, guys in the building, right? Turn your phones off. Don't watch TV. All that bullshit. Ultimately, they're going to have to have some tough conversations. If that's what ultimately um, is the case where the staff likes a guy and then the front office likes another guy or just the general manager likes this guy, but everybody else is like, yo, I think we should go in this direction. That's, that's when you're going to find out what this group is made of and how this, this will be the first test. And it's the biggest one they'll probably encounter on this philosophical approach of everybody being on the same page, because at the end of the day, Whatever decision they make, everybody's got to be on board. Whether they, you know, love the guy initially or not, if that's who they're rocking with, everybody's got to be on board and be thrilled about the pick. And it, it was the same thing that happened in San Francisco, and this is why I, I love that he's gone through this before because Kyle Shanahan wanted Mac Jones, and I think it was the rest of the group that wanted Trey Lance, and they were able to convince Kyle that – Dude, Matt Jones ain't it. This is the direct. Now, ultimately, it didn't work, so it's easy to, in hindsight, to say they made the wrong decision, but I still think it was the right decision. So AP has the final say. He, he has the veto power. And if he wants to stand on you know, the, the fact that he's the GM and he has the final say, he can say, he can overrule everybody and say, no, nah, we, we going with the guy that I want. But that's not in the best interest of the message that's been conveyed to everyone, which is we're in this together and we're going to make decisions together as a group. And so I think they're going to have long, hard discussions about what to do, what direction to go in, and so many people think that Cliff Kingsbury is, is you know, spearheading a lot of this. He's not. He's a, 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 a part of this process, but by no means is he the point man on this. You're, you're not drafting a quarterback to fit Cliff Kingsbury's scheme. What if Cliff's not here in two years? The, the, the goal isn't to find a guy that can play for Cliff Kingsbury in his scheme. The, the goal is to find a guy that can be scheme diverse and can play for 15 years, no matter who's calling the plays. It just so happens that Cliff will be getting the first crack at it. That's the goal. So anyway, I digress. That's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T here on the command post live you know what it is post up take command so as i mentioned out of the office the next few days um hopefully nothing crazy happens i don't expect anything off the wall to happen but if it does i won't be able to react to it until uh monday at the earliest that said um 
I won't leave you contentless. I've given you the outline of what to expect from me. Got two videos on Friday, another video on Saturday, and that'll take you out till uh, the end of the month. And then we start anew on Monday, which will be the first day of April. <clears throat> and man, we hit the ground running at that, that point. So, and I have some stories to tell when I come back, probably. That's my guess, but that'll be for the podcast. Anyway, uh, that's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T, here on this installment of the Command Post. Until next time, you guys, enjoy the rest of your evenings, and I'll see you guys on the other side of the, the month, right? The other side of the, uh, the next month on the calendar, rather. Until then, y'all take care. God bless. Good night.